Okay, so we're going to call the meeting to order at 6.23. Thank you, everybody, for being here. This is the meeting of your board, and we're going to have some community dialogue uh, today. Uh, as, as we begin today, let us consider this moment as the first notes in a new symphony of possibilities. New beginnings ask us to break the pattern of our routines, to recognize what could be, and to embrace these possibilities with courage and tenderness. Uh, our primary focus today is going to be to review the budget framework, which is essentially for us clarifying how we plan to achieve our mission, our goals, and our strategic plan. Our aim is to bring forward a budget that our communities can support uh, and that uh, propels us, for lack of better words, to a sustainable future that takes into consideration our community connectedness and to use our resources most effectively, uh, we need to have a shared understanding of our vision, our mission, our core values, and with this strong vision of what the, um, this budget presentation today, which is really a framework, uh, we will have, all have a collective understanding of what uh, we want for our students. That's the hope. And of course, there is, uh, there'll be plenty of time for dialogue today. Uh, our core values, as you know, are humanity and justice, well-being, rigorous curriculum and instruction, community engagement, and transparent and responsible leadership. Our, our, those, these are our guiding principles for our leadership team and also for our board. And we have given uh, our leadership team also uh, our parameters as, as a board. And why I'm saying all of this is that I want us to be able to connect all the dots of the work that we've been doing uh, to get us to to today. Uh, at Washington uh, Central, we are also, uh, Stephen included in his memo, the educational equity uh, uh, policy and what, how we define equity. So at uh, Washington Central and Fire New School District, we're dedicated to taking real tangible steps to create a safe and supportive learning environment without barriers. We strive to affirm every individual's identity and to celebrate our differences, to foster a sense of belonging for everyone connected to our schools. We are committed to developing inclusive educational opportunities that are culturally relevant and historically grounded. Addressing biases, prejudice, and discrimination while creating more opportunities for everyone to thrive. We aim to foster cultural humility and personal growth in an environment that respects diversity and promotes inclusion. And why I'm saying this is that I hope as we proceed today, I encourage us, all of us for our discussions to uh, approach them with kindness and curiosity. Uh, let us listen deeply. I know that there's many, emotion, uh, many emotions pro today probably in the room. So let's all take a deep breath and be present here to work together. You know, this is not the board. At right this moment, we're sitting one in front of the other. As we do the community dialogue, we're gonna all blend in into tables together. There's no us or you. We are in this work uh, together. So. Thank you for your commitment to your children, and let's begin our meeting. The first uh, thing that I would like to do is to make a little adjustment into our agenda with the permission of the board to add on, uh, after public comment, to not have the public wait, an executive session for personal. So, are there any? It's after the um, second public comment, the one at yes, the end of the meeting. The, yes, number, so it'll be number 11, and then 12 will become adjourned. Could I have a motion to accept the agenda as modified? It so, would be an executive session for personnel, for the purpose of personnel. So yes. moved. So moved. So moved. Patrick, a second. second. Thank you, Elizabeth. All those in favor of the agenda as modified, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Hearing none, we have an agenda approved by our board. And now we're going to. Uh, we have public comments at the at the beginning. Uh, so, if there's any other public comments that are not part that you see on the agenda or that you want to share after the presentation, if you want to speak now, please uh, raise your hand, whether you're online or in person. Otherwise, we'll have a little time. We'll have plenty of time after the presentation. Oh, do you like it? Uh, I'm trying to see online. Anybody online has? I don't see any. I don't see any hands up. Okay, I'm gonna practice. I'm not a teacher. I'm gonna practice silence for a minute. Are you sure? There's no public comments. <laughs> okay. So, 
We are not, is my understanding, we're not going to have a math presentation today because Gillian is sick. Yeah, we yeah. extend our, our apologies if you were coming here for the math presentation. <laughs> um, so, I, unfortunately, Gillian wasn't able to be here. Um, she's not feeling well. So, we'll catch this up on the other end of the, the year when we circle back around. So, with that, I'm going to give it back. Uh, to you, Stephen, so that we, you can share with us the framework for our budget development. Great. Um, I just want to thank everybody for being here tonight. Um, and, um, and so, just want to kind of put this in a little bit of context. Um, so, the, the memo that I sent out is, uh, is kind of a, uh, a broad reaching, how are we going to develop our budget this year? And, and the slideshow that I'm going to do is going to be snippets of this. Um, so I encourage the board, if you have any questions during this part of the presentation, please speak up, uh, and then we'll get to the community engagement part after the presentation. It's, um, it's probably not even a full 40 minutes, um, unless you ask a lot of questions, but that's okay. Um, and I just want to, um, to say that the, the uh, budget that we're developing, this process is slightly different than we've done it in the past. Many times we've approached the budget uh, from here's our baseline and what do we need to cut to get to where we want to go. We, um, we turned that around and said, okay, what do we need in order to build um, some of the supports? And this is a, an attempt to answer some of those questions around what's kind of a base model for our educational system and what we want to do, and then what are the additional supports, enrichments, and uh, interventions that we might need to add on to that uh, to be able to create a robust system. And then there's even beyond that, so what are some of the co-curricular um, programming and those kinds of things as well. And so, um, so as we get into um, to this process, what I want to set up today is the framework for what we are looking at, and then we'll add dollars to it when we uh, present the actual budget uh, in another couple of weeks. And, and this is really in a response as well to uh, some of the comments during our uh, configuration meetings, which is what's the why and the how before the what um, of, of how much we need to pay for that. Daniel. Stephen, I, I just wanted to ask, uh, having read the memo, I was hoping that the presentation could reflect just a little bit more emphasis on how specific things represented, like how we're thinking about specific things and how they represent a departure from how we did them before. I was thinking sure. about the centralized services, especially if you could talk about the ones that weren't previously centralized, for example. Oh, okay. Yes, I, I think I can probably bring that out as, I'm, as we're going <coughs> through those. Thank you. Um, and some of them were centralized and we probably didn't call them that. But we'll, we'll talk about that as well. All right, so I'm going to give me just a second here so I can sl share my uh, slideshow so the community can see that. All right. All right. There it is. All right, so um, so this year our budget, if, oh, let's get, see if that actually gets, there it is. Um, we have a, uh, a budget development timeline. We're sitting here at the uh, November 6th part of this, but we have actually started some of these processes all right, already with our training and talked through our configuration um, uh, processes. <coughs> Um, you'll see that, uh, that we'll bring the full budget draft uh, number one to the board in two weeks, and then there will be another chance for community engagement in December around that, and then the 18th will, will be the uh, budget draft number two if we need to make modifications to, to one, with a, a goal of getting us to a final budget warned um, on, at the January 15th, um, bringing us to the, um, the town meeting days. So just a reminder that our mission is to nurture and inspire in all students passion, creativity, and power to contribute to their local and global communities. Given the recent events, I would say that this becomes more and more important for us um, to make sure that our kids are, are getting this kind of education. We base our, our work on the, um, the core values and beliefs of our district that were developed as part of our strategic planning process. And um, the goals of that strategic plan are 
um, to build and nurture a culture of well-being and inclusivity, challenge and empower and engage students through evidence-based instructional strategies and curriculum and varied educational opportunities, and foster and commit to responsible leadership that engages the community and communicates transparently. So those are our big three goals. There's a lot of little details underneath those. And then we, we have the AOE's definition of equity, and it's certainly codified in our board policy of C29 so that we make sure that every student has access to the educational resources and rigor they need at the right moment in their education across race, gender, ethnicity, language, disability, sexual orientation, family background, and or family income. And then just to kind of put a little box around our budget building goals, um, we were building a budget based on a framework for multi-layered system of supports and the educational quality standards and we want to focus our decision making on programs and services that meet the goals of our strategic plan. So that's kind of what we're looking at in all of this. These are the board parameters that were used as part of our development. We've had this conversation a couple of times. And then I just want to say here, our frameworks um, that kind of help develop what we're looking at, we have class size, and the class size memo is being revised, but you'll see some of the components of it as we get through this um, presentation. Um, we're also listening for feedback so that we can refine it more fully uh, for all of this. The ed quality standards gives us a, um, another part of the framework for how what kind of programming that we should do to make sure that our kids get a quality education here in Vermont. And the multi-layer system of supports, um, for those of you who are not familiar with multi-layer system of supports, it's, uh, it's a way for us to think about educating students so that the um, lay early layers, one and two, are um, initial classroom instruction, and that's done by a licensed educator with a high quality curriculum. Uh, layers three through six are more targeted and intensive interventions and supports for students um, who may need academic, behavioral, or social emotional supports. And so you'll see us talk about this a little bit more. Um, and this gets to um, that framework for budgeting. We're going to really show you that we, we focused on what are those layer one and two. That's kind of a baseline for everybody. And then what are the additional supports that kids uh, might need um, as we go through this. I just wanted to quickly show you um, just kind of the leadership structure around this so you, you kind of get an idea of where people are located um, as we talk about this process. Uh, so the central office is made up of myself, superintendent, the director of curriculum instruction and assessment, that's one person, the business manager and the HR director, those are the administrative positions within the central office. And what we're calling centralized services, these are those other people, the director of student support services, that's, um, that person is located at central office but provides services across the entire district for special education and other things. We have a facilities director, we're working on a model that has a food service director, we have a communi community connections director, and we'll show how that's done, and an IT operations manager. Um, and those people provide services across all the school. Not that the central office folks don't, but they're more directly related to, um, to student activities. And then the schools, there's a principal for each school. Uh, it can be prorated for under 10 teacher um, FTEs, so that's 10 full-time teachers. And there's, um, uh, there's a way for us to, to calculate what number of assistant principals might a school need. A, a elementary school, these numbers one to 400. Um, for the elementary and one to 300 for middle and high school. And so looking at our multi-layer system of supports, um, a strong program is both consistent and predictable while being able to maintain flexibility and responsiveness. I know those may seem contradictory, but uh, our, our classroom instruction across our elementary schools, our middle and our high school, we want there to be a consistent curriculum. We have math programs, we have reading programs um, that we use across the district as part of our high quality uh, curriculum. And we want their teachers to be engaging in um, lesson and unit planning that is part of what we call universally designed instruction. So this is instruction that meets the, the needs of all of our students um, in a classroom and provides uh, basic accommodations for them um, in that classroom. Um, and then the layers three through six are, as I said before, increasingly targeted intensive interventions. So this usually involves a smaller number of kids um, working one-on-one uh, -on -one with a teacher 
Um, so these are usually small group uh, interventions that are focused around reading, math, um, behavior, social emotional skills, but they can also uh, occur in places like their morning meetings and their TAs and those kinds of places as well um, so that we can provide some of those interventions and supports. There's a lot more information on this on the CIA website that's linked there um, in, the, uh, in the slide and so you're welcome to go spend hours looking through all of those curriculum and, and programming. Um, I wasn't going to, to do that to us right now. So this framework is we're trying to create class configurations that allow for diversity, multiple instructional groupings, and a gender balance. We also want to make sure, and let me fix something here, I see. Um, excuse me. Um, we also want to make programmatic decisions about our course offerings. Um, so that our efforts will be made to mo both meet the minimum class size requirements and maintain a broad range of programming in order to offer rich and expanded learning opportunities. We, we know and we can see um, in our early planning that some of our class sizes don't, um, aren't large enough, but if we want to offer diverse classes, um, it may mean that we have a few smaller classes in places uh, throughout the district. Um, and then we also want to be multi-age or multi-grade by design. We don't want it to be driven by our enrollment, and so we want to make sure that we're trying to uh, keep a consistent kind of pathway um, for this. Um, not always possible. I will say that these two bullets, um, actually all three of those bullets can be challenging depending on our school, our location, and the uh, makeup of the students that are um, in any of those classes. And, and let's get the next. And then here's our class size recommendations. These come from the Ed Quality Standards and from research. This is um, what our leadership team felt like our uh, class size goals should be, is to, to strive for, um, for in pre-K, it's actually based on square footage um, or, and cannot exceed 20 students. I know that sounds odd, but there are requirements from the Department of Health around this. Um, K-3, we, uh, we want to strive for an average class size of about 16 with a minimum of 13 and certainly no more than 20. Um, grades 4 through 6, we want to go for 18 but have a minimum of 15, um, maximum of 25. And 7 through 12, the, the same average class size of 18, minimum of 17 in those grade levels. We feel like those class sizes allow to, to meet, I'm going to go back allow us to create those class configuration that allows for diversity, multiple instructional groupings, and gender balance. And so those two things go together, those class sizes and the desire to be able to do those things go together. Steven? Yes. Have, have these been updated for, for the coming budget and the coming school yes. year? Yes. So I, I did want to hear some feedback. I want to hear what people say about this. Uh, and then the memo uh, from the superintendent about class sizes is being updated to share with the board at the next meeting as part of the budget. Thank you. Yep. So do you want to hear now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So are there any um, schools that actually meet the class size uh, recommendations here? Yes. Currently in the system? Yeah, so um, I would say that the majority of our classes, as we're looking at our configurations next year, um, can meet these, um, these class size requirements. What we also wanted to set up is when we can't meet them, um, what's our vetting process for that class? So if we go under our uh, minimum, like how do we uh, agree as a leadership team that that's a, uh, one that we want to be able to do? And, and then the other side of that is, is, are there situations in which we want more than 25 kids in a class? And there are some classes where that is feasible. You know, usually they're in PE um, and music are the places where you might see that. Um, and we make allowances for those um, exceptions. But we also want to make sure that we're both um, reviewing any of those exceptions and able to provide you with a report to the board to show you where that's occurring. And so when we set this, we knew that we may not meet it in all situations, but we can meet it in a majority of, of situations in the district. So this isn't a requirement to strive for a goal? Um, there is a part of it that we strive for, yeah, but I think overall we, we, we're looking at how do we configure our classrooms so that they meet these requirements. <clears throat> so the next question is, does that configuration take place within the school or across schools? Right now within the schools. Our configuration as, as directed by the board is five elementary schools and a middle and high school. Okay, thank you. Wow. All right, 
So layer one and two instruction at the elementary level, this just kind of gives you an idea of how do they use their instructional time. This is what all students should experience, um, is a morning meeting, 150 minutes of literacy, about 60 minutes of lunch and recess, 40 minutes for allied arts on average per day, uh, math, um, 90 minutes, and science and global citizenship, 25 minutes. Now I would just stress here that the literacy time um, can be used for science readings, global citizenship, those kinds of things as well. Um, and, uh, and intervention times would be included in the longer literature and math blocks is where some of the interventions would work for kids. Those would be the things that we talk about in layers three through six that occur. All right. Now at the middle school, um, they have a core curriculum that's done um, in the, the cores, um, as we call them. So, um, and they're looking at uh, lo creating looping with a priority for expanding student choice in areas of uh, electives. Um, this is actually a place where we're working on, like we're not, we don't have this fully engaged, but we're trying to make sure that we are able to, um, to provide our students elective opportunities within this core structure. And then at the high school, um, they're really working on auditing their courses and offerings to ensure that there's both continuity for students while examining the enrollment in those AP courses, early college, CVCC. And the budgeting decisions are going to prioritize coherence and grade team experiences for 9th and 10th grade as well as 11th and 12th. So we have a teaming structure for our 9th and 10th grade uh, groups. Um, and they're looking at how do we continue that teaming structure as well as creating um, some kind of teaming structure around the 11th and 12th grade as well, probably more broadly around both grades. That's what kind of layer one and two instruction would look like. And then the academic and social emotional learning um, services that go with layer one and two, these are our school counselors, our school nurse, our library media. Um, instructional coaching, I'll highlight that that's a really difficult one for us right now to actually put in, but that is, would be considered a layer one and two service. Also our multilingual learner instructors, work-based learning coordinator, that's a position at the high school level. Um, these are all things that are base, right? This is what we need to, to provide kids with, um, with a foundational education. Um, there are, as you can see there, prorated numbers for our school counselors, our school nurse, and our library media. Um, those are prorated for this layer one and two. Hang on to that because as we talk about layers three through six, there are ways where those could be expanded. All right. And so layers three through six, these are those targeted as intensive behavioral and academic interventions. So we may above our base level, and these are determined at the school level based on the needs of the students in that school. Um, there may be a need for additional FTE of school counselor, nurse, and library media, right? And so where you saw the prorated numbers, so the prorated numbers may say for a school that um, you only have a school counselor for two days a week within the base allocation. If the school determines a need for additional school counselor because of SEL needs, then the school, based on the way that we're distributing the money, can make that kind of decision on whether or not they want to do it. Uh, one school may choose to have additional school counselor, another one may choose to have a little more library media, depending on the needs of the kids within that school and, and you know, some of the, the, the uh, wishes of the community itself. Um, Interventionists usually determine more from data, right? What students need additional supports for math and reading. Um, also, there may be some behavioral interventionists that we have as part of this. And then um, other positions like social worker, SAP, that's drug and alcohol counselor, behavior specialist, a dean of students. Those are positions that support additional targeted intensive behavioral and academic interventions. And so that is a second layer of how do we fund our schools. So we fund them at a base layer, and then based upon our student needs, we allocate funds to the schools. Um, and, and we know what those needs are. Um, if you looked at the memo, um, we kind of broke that down. The, mo the money would be allocated according to um, the long-term weighted average daily membership of those schools, which takes into account things like poverty, uh, language learners. Um, it takes into account sparsity, so that's the kind of the distribution of kids within the, within the school system. Those things are all taken into account in how we distribute funds to the school itself. 
And so this is an effort to really look at how do we equitably distribute funds based on student needs as defined by the state um, in the long-term weighted average daily membership. Now, I will also just be trying to be transparent. That's not every fund that we're given from the state general fund divided up amongst the schools because there are those centralized services that we'll talk about as well. Kind of starting with special education. So our funding for special education is done as a centralized service across our entire district. And so we really want to make sure that the budget for special education is allocated in a way that meets our student needs. And so it's done a little bit differently. It's going to be done in collaboration with the principals, um, and it's really looking at caseload sizes and how we distribute um, the, our case managers and our, our uh, special educators so that we meet those needs depending on what the school needs are. Um, those can shift. They can be uh, more intensive in one school than another. Um, typically, if we include this in as part of the school base, um, it looks like one school may have higher per pupil spending because there may be a student with higher needs within that school and it tends to skew their data. So we're not trying to put that into how we're going to look at the school distribution of funds, but instead look at how is the district doing that. Because at any given time a student moving into or out of the district could change the need at a school. And so we want to be able to manage this um, from the central office point, but really collaborating with the people that are closest to the students in terms of what services that they need. Um, and so this also allows us some uh, district-wide approach to uh, developing schedules for related services such as uh, occupational therapists, speech and language pathologists, and our psychologists. And so we're able to do those as well. Um, so I, I think it's kind of hidden there. I'm sorry. I, I'm having a little trouble with my with one of these. You'll see. That. All right. So recommendations in FTE. Um, for teaching staff, paraeducator staff, and efficient service delivery system across multiple school buildings and grade levels will be based on an efficient service delivery model. What that means is we're looking at how do we uh, balance that uh, the personnel with the needs of the students. So one school may only have um, eight uh, students that are on a caseload. That's a little bit low for what a caseload would be, but another school may have 15 which may be pushing it a little bit higher. So we're trying to balance the, the needs of the schools and the students with the staff that we have. Um, it's a little complicated, um, and certainly this is going to be an area that's going to take us a couple of years to uh, develop a good process for, um, but we're certainly um, just trying to make sure that we show how much money in total are we using for special education, um, and then what's our service delivery model across all those schools. Hopefully, I'm, I'm making some sense with the way I'm saying this. <laughs> All right. And so, <coughs> facilities is another centralized service. Um, we, have, we have usually been including the facilities budget within the school budgets when we've been reporting this. Um, so, Daniel, this is one of those areas I can highlight. Um, so overall, facilities are responsible for cleaning, maintenance, and upkeep of the physical plant. And we assign custodians to each building. The, the staffing levels at each building are determined uh, by the square footage of that building. So we work with um, some of our uh, partners. Hilliard is one of them that we work with to determine what level of staffing is needed for a building of X number of square feet. Um, and so that's how we look at, at, uh, at how we place our um, our FTEs, you know, those, those uh, the hours of service that we need at those schools to, to get that work done. Um, the, the staffing of this, there's a facilities director that's at the district level and then at the school level there's custodians, head custodians, maintenance, uh, lead maintenance and maintenance and mechanics. These are the people, that, the job titles that fall within facilities. We really want to make sure that this is done. The facilities director should be running all of this, making sure that this is all working. Um, so that our principals aren't spending time work, working on facilities and doing that work and instead are focused on instructional um, leadership within their schools. Um, and so I, I know that there's been some questions about do we keep something like a facilities director? There's actually one of the more recent state um, acts. I'm sorry, there are too many numbers to remember which act this was, but um, this is a requirement of uh, districts uh, coming in the future. I don't know that it's gone fully into implemented law, but. Um, but the facilities director is a necessary position according to the state rules. All right. 
technology. This is district-wide um, uh, centralized service. The IT is responsible for the network operations, software, hardware. There's an IT operations manager, network support, and administrative assistant. This is a pretty lean organization. You'll remember that last year um, we cut the director of technology. Um, I'm not sure that we're, we're looking at whether or not that was uh, the best move for us based on the needs of our schools, but we'll talk to the, we're, we're talking internally about that and we'll certainly bring that to the board if we think that uh, this model is not serving us and the needs of our students. Um, but uh, right now, this is the staffing that we have um, in this area. And then transportation, um, transportation is contracted through first student um, and, um, and it's not just transportation to and from school, it's also field trips, athletic transportation, those kinds of things. Our contract is actually up for negotiation um, next year, but we can extend that contract um, if we want to, so that's a decision that the Transportation Committee will be looking at, or we can um, look at a new contract beginning in uh, FY27. Like I said, that'll be up to the committee to decide what's the appropriate way there. Um, and so this is another one of those centralized services. It's been that way. Um, this is no change to the way we've budgeted before. And then food service, um, we have a universal meals program within our state. So that's, they're responsible for the universal meals. Um, staffing levels are informed by calculating what we call meals per labor hour formulas and this is, um, I, I put a link there, this is another one of those rabbit holes if you'd like to learn more about uh, school food programs and how you staff them, um, you're welcome to do that. Um, we are looking at having a district food service director. Um, there's cook, assistant cook and food service workers uh, depending on the building and the needs at each of those buildings. Uh, the district food service director is, a, is, is modifying a position that we had at U32, but we're trying to make it district-wide so that we can try to bring down the costs um, of our food procurement, um, have, uh, honest, have some substitute uh, support for a school, because uh, if, if, in some of our schools there's only one person uh, that works there, and so being able to provide support to that one person um, is pretty important. This doesn't look like an expansion of uh, the cost for the board. The board um, allocates a small amount of money. I say small, uh, it's small to the overall budget um, and this food service brings in its own funds. So it's self-funding to a point. Um, we do subsidize it as a board. Um, and so we'll make sure that we highlight what is that subsidy that comes from the board and how much is then also done through the food service budget itself. And then um, our capital expenses, the board has adopted a multi-year capital spending plan. Um, it's funded two ways, right? So there's a direct allocation that you vote on as part of your budget and there are times where we have transferred from the fund balance to increase that amount. Um, and so this is an area, I know the word uh, that was questioned was discretionary. So this is an area where the board certainly can make some discretionary decisions about um, about how much money we're putting towards our capital planning in each uh, year. And so this is certainly an area where, where we can do that. All right, and then, let's get the, right. Now, community connections. Um, so this is the child care services that create school day and full week care to our pre-K students and provide some before and after school care in some locations <coughs> for our interest, interested families. There is an allocation that comes out of the general fund to support this program, but they also get funding from parent fees and they get some supplemental funding from uh, the state federal grants and some subsidies through DCF. So this is pretty complex in some of the ways that it works. These are district employees that, that are part of Community Connections and they are also funded through uh, many different sources than just the general fund. And so uh, this is an area I think where um, there's been some questions, uh, particularly as we look at the current program locations as to what we can um, and can't do. Um, so right now, um, Berlin has two sessions of pre-K that uh, include a full school day on Monday and a morning program for all interested students, K-6. So the way pre-K works is pre-K might be a morning program and then Community Connections is there for the afternoon um, or flip that, Community Connections is the morning and the pre-K program. We run the pre-K program as part of our school program, Community Connections fills in the gaps for some of our families. 
Um, and so, so you can see that we do two sessions of pre-K at Berlin, one session at Calus um, that is actually a combined pre-K K class uh, to be able to do that. So that one's a little bit different as well. There's no program at Doty. Um, the pre-K is over at, uh, at Rumney. Um, and the after, if you look at Rumney, they also have an afternoon program. Um, students from Doty who are a part of the Community Connections uh, go over to Rumney for that afternoon program. Um, they're bussed over for that. Um, East Montpelier has two sessions of pre-K, very similar to Berlin, um, and, but they, and they have morning and afternoon care there. You can see that this is different depending on the schools. A part of that is because sign-ups are an important part of being able to run the program. So if there are not enough students signed up at one school location, then we don't get the parental fees. We're not able to, to do that kind of program um, at those schools. And so um, it's not always just we don't want to do it there. We may not have enough students to justify um, having the personnel there. And so there, there's a few different ways for us to look at this. This is definitely an area I know of interest based upon when we talked about configuration and all of that, where we probably need to do a lot more work and we have more pre-K um, changes coming in the future where we may be, um, we may be offering, depending on what the, the rulings actually come through in the state, um, full day pre-K, full day, full week pre-K for our four-year-olds. This is an area that will definitely see some changes um, and some decisions on our part as to how we want to address those needs over time. This doesn't have community connections information for school age. Yep, actually, so that's the morning programs um, or the afternoon programs. So there's, there's several morning programs and then there's a couple of afternoon programs. Okay, so that means all grades. Yes. Yes, those serve interested students grades K-6. Yeah. 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 All right, and then the last part, um, this is actually at the school level, um, so that um, so that kind of this isn't a centralized service, but uh, co-curricular activities at uh, middle and high school, that's an athletic director, athletic <coughs> trainer, and that middle school after the bell program, those are middle school, high school programs. I threw in a term there that's probably not common to everybody called third space, right? And so there's a link there to a third space. This is that time that is not academic and not uh, necessarily sports, a theater, those kinds of things. It's like, what are those other spaces that we provide for kids uh, to be able to engage in activities? Um, so this is another area I know that has come up as to how do we do this or how do we want to do this? Um, we will talk about the school level first as to what they think that they can do and whether or not our budgets can support some of these activities. This is an area where we certainly would have to probably add to our budget if we were going to expand any of this and I would say that that's going to be difficult mm -hmm. for us and so so we have that. <coughs> All right so I just want to refer back to the memo as well. I didn't put everything in there, but there's a lot, there's more information about what the base staffing level, the intervention enrichment staffing look like and the positions that we might support. And then, um, and so when we think about the money that is going to a school, well, let me, let me start it out. There's two big slices of pie. One of them are those uh, centralized services. The other slice of that pie are the school-based services, right? And so those centralized services are those, many of those things that we just went through in the last part of the slideshow. Um, once we take the necessary general fund money to, to provide that, the remaining money, or you can look at it the other way, um, but the remaining money is divided up amongst the schools through that long-term weighted average daily membership calculation. Um, it is not the total amount of money that we get going to each school, but that slice of the pie for the schools is then broken into three parts as well. Right? So their base staffing levels necessary to get layers one and two, their um, staffing needed to provide those interventions in layers three through six, and then finally there's, there's a smaller part, those non-instructional funds that are for the supplies and um, books and things like that, uh, field trips. So the schools will have allocated to them funds to be able to, to do each of those things. And so when we bring you the budget and we start showing you those numbers, we're going to break it out into those pie slices 
um, not just the big pie slice of here's what's going to all the schools, but what is going to each of those schools individually. And that allows us then to look at what is our uh, cost per pupil at each of our schools. It should be based upon our model, right? So how much do we divide up into each of those schools? And it also allows us to see other things like staffing levels at the schools and, and, and things like that to meet those needs of our kids. I hope this has helped to kind of clarify the framework that we're going to use so that when you see the budget and you start seeing the pie slices, you know where they're coming from uh, when we do that part of the presentation. I'm happy to take questions. Question for us for clarification, Stephen. Um, on, on slide 10, um, leadership, a lot of the numbers that you gave in the presentation, you, 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 just, you told us where the, where the numbers came from, but I didn't, I didn't catch where the um, ratios came from, so the 1 to 400. Uh, students uh, for a principal and the one to 300 for a, uh, an elementary yep. uh, assistant principal um, are those um, are those what we're hoping for or are those guidelines from the state or something okay so let's start with the principal yep. the the state requires you to have a full-time principal when you have 10 FTEs uh, teacher. of teacher okay right so so that number comes from the state requirements the assistant principal numbers we took out of the PICAS report, so you may have heard when that came out, it gave us a guideline for that, um, for us to be able to look at the baseline um, needs of our schools. So where did PICAS get the numbers? Oh, I'll, have to, I'll have to go through and look. They, they cite a, a lot of research, um, okay. so I would have to go through and dig that out. Yeah, they've got a whole section of research around that piece. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. so, Stephen, when you um, were last explaining about the centralized services being budgeted and then uh, budget parceled out to the schools depending upon the long-term weighted average, uh -huh. is there any money kept back um, by the central office as kind of a, um, a uh, fund balance in case any needs develop within the individual schools during the year that were not anticipated? Um, so, so in other words, do we have some reserve funds available if there are additional needs? Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that our fund balance is actually the spot where we, that's our cushion. So we have a fund balance that's there. Um, and I think that that's the appropriate use of a fund balance should we have a surprise that comes up. And so that it would be our, I think it would be our job to determine what level of fund balance do we want to maintain. Um, for those emergencies and say how much then would we need to budget for to make sure that we maintain that. Um, but I, I specifically building into the central office funds or centralized service funds, um, I, I, don't, I don't recommend it honestly. I think actually saying what our fund balance should be maintained at would be our best way to approach that. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. so, question of clarification. Just because I want to give it now before. So it was very helpful to see your breakdown of. Can you talk to the mic then just to make sure, I want to make sure that. I and then we can, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a breakdown of, it was helpful throughout the slides to see like when you did facilities and then what's the personnel under that, um, mm -hmm. um, food services. For um, central office, I'm not sure we're capturing all of it. So I know that there are a number of tasks that have been taken on by central office over the years. And so I'm, it would be helpful for me to see all of the roles and the services that they're doing there. Yep, so when we bring the budget, we'll bring um, the staffing levels at each one of those slices of pie. So when we talk about the facilities, we'll tell you how many people that is for facilities, how many people are at central office, how many people are needed for special education. We'll have those numbers for each of the schools, each of the centralized services, so you'll see what the FTEs are for that. Mm -hmm. um, clarification question. Sure. So when you're talking about the slice of pie and you're talking about dividing up that last slice, essentially, and you're talking about it in regards to the ADM, mm -hmm. I'm assuming it's just based on numbers and not need. And then they take the, the, whatever they get and they break it up into addressing all the various needs within the school. Is that correct? Um, almost. Okay. And so I would say that um, the way that we look at distributing the money to the schools is based upon those needs that are associated okay. with the long-term weighted average daily membership. So, okay. um, so think about we have a big... I wish I could say a really big pot of money. We have a pot of money, uh -huh. um, and that money is then um, we look at each school for its poverty levels, its English language learner levels, um, it is its sparsity. Am I forgetting one? 
size. That's correct. So, so yeah, there's a size consideration that's a part of that calculation. So the size of the school, number of uh -huh. kids that are in it. And then there's also a, a, a different multiplier for high school than there is for elementary school, given the additional needs that uh, usually occur with the high school. It's not a huge multiplier, but it does change the, the amount of funds that are allocated per pupil. And so we'll divide up. So this is, this is what's hard for us sometimes is that that number is really not, when we get that number, it'll say something like there are 250 kids in a school that has 180 mm -hmm. in it because of the multipliers that are attached to it for those different areas of need. Um, and so um, what we will do, that helps us actually though distribute the money in an equitable way to the needs of that school and the needs of the students within that school, but it can get a little complicated. When we bring this, when we bring it back down, I think it'll be important for us also to look at what's the per pupil spending based upon the actual number of kids that are in the building as well, um, so that we can just use that as a reference point uh, for our work. Thank you. Yes, Daniel. Um, one, one piece of feedback, I was curious um, when we see the next iteration of the budget, if we could uh, have an understanding of what percentage of the community connections budget, what percentage of the food service budget as enterprises rep is represented by the budget allocation versus the fees and other, in other revenue sources. Yep. That would be particularly helpful. And then I was also curious, um, in terms of community connections, uh, whether we have district-wide standards and, and also what the oversight of that program is beyond you, the superintendent. Yeah, so there is a community connections director um, that is a part of that. Um, I will say that I think that this is an area for us to really look at how do we utilize it and how can we make sure that it supports the greatest number of kids. So I think that there's some work to be done around making sure that we have some common programming um, and some consistent programming across the district um, for all of our kids. Yeah, and I, I would also add like enlisting community, like we've had a big push for volunteerism in, in the Callis community and soliciting similar volunteerism in that program area, I think it's, it's ripe for innovation there. Mm -hmm. right. There's, so I, I, I don't want to step too far out on that, but also remember that it's a pre-K program and so there's all kinds of unique licensing and, um, and uh, there's, there's a lot of requirements that we just need to make sure that we meet as well. Not that we can't, I just want to make sure that that program could require some additional needs that other programs might not because of the pre-k nature of it so mm -hmm. not that they're insurmountable but they are just different mm -hmm. well that would be true as well if it's gaining child care financial assistance for Correct. school age so it would be licensure there uh, right, child right. Care and it, it, it's just a more complicated system than just the our regular like just kindergarten is easier to understand than pre-k um, so it's, I, I will admit as the former high school, middle school guy, that learning about pre-K has been a, quite the steep learning curve. Um, there's so much more there than I ever even imagined. I respect to my elementary uh, principals on that one. <clears throat> Any other questions for? Um, Stephen, on page 18, you were talking about how certain funds are allocated to the schools and then schools can decide within what types of um, services to provide. Where does, like if, if they were gonna hire a social worker, mm -hmm. um, would they go through the central office? And what would be necessarily be the availability? Are they hiring point one, point two, or, or how, does, how does that work? Or, is, or do we have a social worker and staff and they're getting a, reserving a portion? Of that person. I would say no to the second part. We don't have anybody on reserve anywhere um, in the district. Um, but what I would say is that if a school identified that as a need, yeah. then that becomes, uh, if it's a new position, um, then that would go through the normal processes of HR. You know, how do we post? What are the requirements? Um, we have job descriptions for these positions. So, so it's, it's a normal process of hiring should we decide to do that. I, I will say that this is the area in which it will be 
difficult at times to decide which interventions and supports do we have. This is, there's not an unlimited amount of money at the schools to be able to provide these services. And so we're, we do believe though that the decisions about these services are best made at the school level because the closer, the people who are closer to students should be making the decisions about how that money is spent so that they get the right services because what's needed at one school may not be the same needs as another school um, for those students. And that may shift over time as well. So we don't want, we, this is that uh, flexible and responsive part of the interventions is that we do need the flexibility to make sure that we're, we're getting the services to kids at the time when they need them. Those may shift over time. And so we just wanna be able to, to, to do that um, as efficiently as possible. It, it can be difficult. And, and we will talk about some of the difficulties when we talk about how we're funding it. So um, in, when you're talking, you're, you've uh, referenced showing the slices of the pie mm -hmm. and, and that. So are, is it going to be presented in a global kind of pie chart with the coloring and a percentage, or will there be specifics to it? So my idea right now is to start showing you how big those slices are and put them together into one pie, both percentage-wise and dollar-wise, so that you can see how we're allocating those funds. Um, and, and I will say this, this is a good time to, to talk about, like, if we want to talk about shifting funding, so if we want to say that we want um, a change in our, um, our, our community connections programs, we wanted to provide more funds to that for them to be able to do additional services, um, we would need to talk about where are those reductions coming from. So what part, which pie slice are we, are we reducing to do that? So we may make a decision. We may say facilities is the spot where we're going to lower our service delivery in facilities. We're not going to clean our rooms every night. We will do basic services, but we won't necessarily do full cleanings in all of our buildings um, so that we can then add funds somewhere else. Purely hypothetical, purely just an example, but I just want you, like those are the decisions that we'll need to make. I'll also say is if we decide that we want to in eliminate individual positions, if that's something that we, and which I'm not recommending that the board gets into, and, I, and this is why, is because if we t talk about uh, removal of individual positions, that money that is there needs to go back into the pot to be divided up amongst the schools. Um, and so we need to talk about programming more than we need to talk about positions so that we, uh, and then as a leadership team, our job is to make sure that we staff those programs appropriately and provide the board with the information that they need to make good decisions around those staffing levels, right? And so, um, so if we were to cut one position, putting that into the pot and distributing it out across all of our students across the district isn't going to necessarily make a big difference for that school, right? And, and so that's an equitable distribution of resources and we wanna make sure that we kind of stay on that and as we're looking at it. We need to be talking about what are the big programs, how do we manage those, and how do we staff for those kinds of things. Why, why would it have Can to go back the into the too? general? Why would it have to go back into this general fund and then be redistributed as opposed to targeted for a different use? So, so you're asking us to do the advocacy model, which would say that if we take from one place and give it to another, it's just because that other place has been vo more vocal than the rest of the district. Well, vocal or needy or in need. So, so our, but our, our funding formula should account for that need. And that's what we're trying to make sure that we do is that because we are looking at the need across all of our schools, our funding should follow the needs um, in that process. So now I'm gonna ask a question that may show my ignorance. Is this the first year that we're using this type of model based on the long-term weighted formula? Yes. Okay. And so is there um, a safety valve that we're going to incorporate in case it's not really meeting the needs? Uh, you know, we hope it will and we expect it will, but if it's not, do we have a safety valve or are we incorporating a safety valve that would address that or is that the fund balance? So I don't want to go to the fund balance yet on that, but our first, uh, as the leadership team, what we're trying to do is here, we, we've kind of said here's our baseline. Um, and here's that additional funds. Does that meet our student needs? Right now, it's, um, I asked the leadership team to start with only a 3% increase from last year's budget and how we're developing that. It's proving a little difficult, as we expected, um, but that means that we can come to you as a board and a community um, and say, here's where we think that we need to, to land 
for us to be able to meet our student needs at this point in time. Mm -hmm. If we have to make decisions from there, we at least know which categories we're going to make those decisions in um, based upon those, the, the way we're going to show the, the pies and the slices to it. So my, my question about a safety valve is more is when it's the budget is actually in effect and it turns out that it may not be meeting the needs as expected. Um, is that where we go with the fund balance? That's where I would say that was where the fund balance should, okay. be, should be utilized. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. There's Daniel and then Patrick. I guess um, I'm struggling with where in this process, like there's a lot of logic to this new approach and reserving some judgment. So far, so good. I guess I'm curious about um, where in the process we understand how it, uh, what the implications are for individual schools and mm -hmm. how it plays out at individual schools and how we respond to someone saying this does not reflect the need of my school or the need of our school and LTWADM for all it's worth doesn't doesn't cut the mustard in terms of reflecting real equity and real need where 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 is that conversation had and how do we have that conversation when when things get hot with with the money involved well, I would say right now we're building the budget kind of from the bottom up in this regard so we're trying to make sure that we meet all of those needs so that the budget that we bring to the board is meeting the needs as we see them at each individual school and so our hope is that when we bring you a budget, we show you here's how we meet those needs, right? And so if, I guess the way, the way to look at it is if we have to expand the pie above that 3% that we're kind of shooting for, then we're going to expand it and bring that information to the board. Um, the board then will have to make the decision, is this what we think is long-term financially sustainable and is this something that our communities can support? Um, and so that's what we're, that's what the leadership team is trying to do right now is how, because one of your priorities is get it to the lowest cost possible. So we started pretty low and it hurts as we start building it, but we also now can say, what are those additional needs and, and how much more might we need to expand the amount of money that we provide to the schools through that formula? But you're approaching that need and that additional need you identify on a district-wide basis. And Correct. you're not looking at it in terms of school-by-school school capacity and school-by-school school adults in the building. Correct. Correct. And so each of the schools is bringing, you know, as, as we're sitting down and doing our budget development, which we're going to get more input tonight that we can add into that, um, as, as a school shows need, we look at, okay, what does, does that fit within the allocation that they have, or is there a need to expand the allocation itself right now? Because this is our first time doing it. This is, you know, we're, we're, we're playing around with the margins right now on this. I think Patrick and, yeah. yeah I had a quick question about, um, so it's the first time we're using this model. Yes. But do we have an understanding of how stable it would be over a five-year period or something, or a couple of years? Um, and if not, I got a follow up. Yeah, so um, our hope is that by doing a budget that is based upon the actual students in the buildings, we can kind of, pro you know, we can hopefully forecast a little bit further out um, what do we think the total amount of funds that we're going to have and to need to meet our student needs um, over that time. So we do think that it'll give us a little bit more. And we're also making, and, and here's, okay, I'm gonna pull out one of the, the little surprises, is that we're looking at it across two years as well. So we're looking at this, do we also think about if, does this set us up to do things like bring the sixth grade to U32? Um, does that change the way that we're looking at the model um, and, and how it's done? Um, and and or does does it also look at how do we uh, staff or or even um, hold things like some of our pre-k and kindergarten classes for some of our smallest schools because we do see that those numbers are low um, and so how do we create staffing to meet those needs do we need to combine up like we've done this year a pre-k k 
uh, program. We're trying not to right now because we heard, we heard the community's uh, input on that, but those are decisions that we may need to make as a two-year process of like, okay, let's get ourselves to here this year, and then in the following year, this is what we're gonna need to do because we can see what these numbers are doing to our schools, you know, the, the declining enrollment. We should be in the next couple of years reaching our kind of low point for our enrollment, um, but there's also no indication that it's going to um, go back up by any, um, there's no, no data that's showing that it's gonna go up once we get there. Maybe sometime way off in the future, but it's not in the immediate future. Um, okay, so my question is, I appreciate what you said, Daniel. Um, my question was like, what happens when a need is identified by the school itself, but it's not supported by the numbers, the data? Um, and so that's part of it. And then the other piece is going beyond that, once that need is identified and the numbers don't necessarily support it, how do you prioritize how you expand that allocation at each school? So I will say that this is part of the process that we're learning right now. So okay. I, I don't think that there's an answer for that right now, but certainly it's the questions that we're exploring. Okay. How do we make sure that we, how do we create a district that's nimble enough to be able to, to meet those fluctuations in need? Thank you. Yeah. I had a couple of questions. Um, when we get the numbers in two weeks, mm -hmm. will there be some narrative on the needs at the schools without divulging individual student needs and how they're being met within the budget that's being proposed to us so we can understand that. Uh, to the extent possible. I think I don't want to over, I don't want to over promise how much we can divulge about some of our student needs because it might identify individual students. But I think we can certainly see the staffing levels needed to meet the needs of that school. That we will be able to show. Thank you. Yeah. Daniel's, Daniel's working on it. I guess I was, I'm curious, as sort of as a follow-up to that, and mm -hmm. I think you gave, a, you gave an example earlier on that made me wonder, in, in this model, do we anticipate more partial FTE positions spread across multiple schools, or do we also, like, similarly, do we anticipate more, like, multifunctional Ed professionals who are who are wearing more than one hat in the same school, and so um, I, I'm sure there's a little chuckle from the principals because that was exactly the question that we were faced with as we were working on the budget this week. It's and and those are definitely things we do want to try to reduce as many partial FTEs or people having to travel between buildings as possible, which leads us to hopefully employing people or supporting people to, to gain um, the ability to do multiple functions within a school. Um, that's an important feature of a small school is having people that may be dual certified or, um, or able to, to do multiple functions. Um, so for example, PE and health together help give us a more robust um, program within any of our schools. But there's also places where we might have an interventionist who is also providing some kind of other supports. And, and I, I, I don't, I, I, there's, there's all kinds of different combinations that you can have there. I, at the middle and high school level, I can speak directly. We have people that are dual certified in things like English and social studies, which means that they, they can serve in both of those uh, roles, which gives greater flexibility to the school in terms of scheduling. So those are the kinds of things that could happen as well. Yeah, but you are right about th that is a dilemma that we face. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious as to what um, U32. So will we have specifics around when we think of the class sizes and when mm -hmm. we think of, uh, you know, that tension between making sure there's those offerings? Um, will there be... Um, there will be part of that as, as yes. your presentation. Yes. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, I don't see any other questions. I'm, I have one maybe suggestion for the next. Oh, and my mic is not on. Okay, now. Ms. Lord, Steven's microphone works really well, if that would work for you. I mean, it's really clear. Okay. 
And just, uh, just because you're yeah, reverberate, I, and I think I'm trying to be helpful. With it. Okay, thank you. We're <laughs> 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 not, but that's my goal. Good. We appreciate that. We appreciate that, Chris. Uh, okay, so I'm just turning this thing off. Okay. It, so in that if we could tie the facility, because sometimes I'm, I just get worried that sometimes facilities and food service and it, it, the three slides that were on a row, especially facilities, it totally is part of student outcomes too. So are people not just, you know, the people working on the building and, uh, and the morale for the staff, the, the benefit, you know, we have those levels, zero to four of cleaningness, right? Like, so it is really important. So how do we tie that to student outcomes too, not just being seen as, a, as an addition? So, right. Yeah, yeah. When, when, we, when we say centralized services about that, that's just where some of the management comes from, but these are real people in the school that make sure our kids get food and they make sure that they have a clean environment to work in. Um, that's why those staffing levels are really important for us to meet those staffing levels of square footage and um, and being able to our meals per labor hour. Those gives us give us measures of what uh, what we need mm -hmm. so that our kids get what they need to be able to learn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now I'm going to introduce Jeannie Phillips, who all of you are familiar with. Thank you, Jeannie. You drove a long way to be with us tonight. We're going to move into community uh, dialogue, and Jeannie is going to facilitate this process for us. So welcome, Jeannie. Thank you for joining us again. Thank you. Um, uh, just to let you know, I arrived here after delivering professional development in another school district, so I wasn't able, I'm coming into this room a little bit cold, um, but I'm going to outline our process and then hopefully get us into groups. Uh, in conversations about this community engagement session, it was really important, we knew there were going to be a lot of people here, that we hear from all voices and not just people brave enough to speak up in front of everyone, and so we're going to divide you in, onto, into tables, to ha or you're going to put yourself into tables to have conversations around three questions um, and you're going to have at your table an administrator who's going to take notes whose job is just to collect what people are saying and some board members at your table who who will be there to be in dialogue with you and to listen well go ahead um, i just like to throw it out there that um, i appreciate right the the work for making sure all voices are heard i would also just say that as a community member um, it takes away our ability to hear our community's voices, and that information often doesn't cycle back to us. Um, and so when we're here for a forum and dialogue, when I'm at a table with a small group of people, I really don't hear from my community. Um, and when something's marketed as a forum and dialogue, it, it, it feels like that really pulls away. And, it, and the information doesn't truly cycle back to us in an authentic way. Would you like to address that? Yeah, I think we're going to. You. We're going to try to do our best. What we are hearing also from some people, a couple, you know, maybe four people were able to join us today. What I'm hearing also from Worcester community is that they're not brave enough to come to our meetings and they want to have a dialogue with us, that they don't feel that they learn from us or that we are able to move into some understanding when we are in a big group. So it becomes more like us against you or you talking back to us or us talking to you. So what this would allow us to have more time to actually get to know each other. Get to you would get to know how your board members uh, make decisions. How you we are all understanding this today at the same time. This is the first time that this is being presented. Uh, you know, I'm not. We're not hiding anything here. The framework is being presented to all of us. We would want to have a shared understanding. When we move out of the groups, we could have a, um, a sharing. We have a little more time today because there was not a math. A presentation all of the information is going to be in we, we have a Google Doc to keep the notes uh, we have had plenty of time uh, in the past for sort of like that just giving input I think what we really want to have is dialogue right and and especially with uh, how polarizing this has been in in the past and we are just all working here together to to make sure that we create a, 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 not just a budget, but like we address and have a, be able to fund the dreams and the expectations and the outcomes that we want for our children. So just give us a chance today. This is not the, we are gonna also talk after, as we move lower in the agenda into engagement uh, and how as, as a board, so the next forum, we could mark the next forum as being a, a big group. So just, could you just give us a chance today? We're going to give it a try, please. Let's try to be in conversation. Okay. 
Right, so we have a, hold on one minute, go ahead. So we're gonna ask folks to lean into a couple of the agreements that we've been using. Um, Let's do, just hold on one minute. Uh, we're gonna have time at the tables, is there, and we'll have time for clarifying questions after she explains. Yeah, so. Yes. So um, as we engage in this process, in this community engagement process and this dialogue, we're gonna highlight a couple norms. We've been using these norms for uh, looking equitable ways to look at data. And one is to recognize that there are multiple truths, that there are different perspectives, people play different roles, they have different experiences and perspectives, and make space for, for different, um, those different perspectives in our dialogue. And the other is to strive for equity of voice, which is really why we chose uh, to have smaller table conversations so that we could provide space for lots of voices um, at those tables. Uh, the process looks like three questions and about 10 minutes per question where your administrators are really listening and taking notes. And those notes are gonna be captured on a Google Doc and I think they're gonna be linked into the document that's public. So those notes will be made public. Am I right about that? Yes. Yes. And um, let's see, I can go ahead and share the three questions if you'd like. Would that be helpful? Yeah. The first question, the first 10 minutes is, what are your biggest takeaways from the budget framework presentation? The second question are, what are your concerns about the budget framework? And the third question is, what seems especially important? What would you like to prioritize? Do you have additional questions about the process? Yeah, um, I guess as a maybe top class, I'm curious if you could both break them into small groups and have this dialogue later because we didn't do any public comment earlier that we could have some time for community, all community dialogue. And then the third question is if it would also be possible for the community to be able to do sort of a Q&A like the board gets to do with, with our superintendent, you know, a after that presentation, I've got a number of questions that I'd love to be able to ask and get like immediate answers to as opposed to ask the questions and then never really hear the answer to them. And so those would be the sort of the three parts that I can envision that would be really helpful to me as a community member. Yeah, and no, the, the hope is that you would ask those questions too in the small in the small groups and there would be that there would be that dialogue. We can add it but depending on how we're doing with time. The answers. You we don't get that's all a dialogue. That's that's Right. Then, then we don't get the answer from Stephen, who's usually the one that knows the answers. Yes. <laughs> so, so, so I, I, I think it's a little, um, I think if the will of the community here is to do it in a larger group, I think we should respect that. I think it sets us up against them if we're not respecting their process. Okay. Uh, Matt, and then Matt. Yeah. I would welcome a chance to uh, participate in small group conversation. I guess, unlike a lot of you, I haven't been participating in a lot Thank of you. these conversations. That's my own limitation. Um, but it would just be really helpful for me to be able to sit down and speak face to face with folks rather than kind of have this large kind of back and forth thing going on where I don't really have a chance to weigh in or kind of understand exactly where people are coming from. So that's just my perspective, but I wanted to share it. So. Okay. Megan. I'm just wondering um, about the folks online. Is there going to be a breakout yeah. for that? Yeah. There's going to be, we have a group that is going to go online and there's two administrators that can break up into two groups. So the hope is to, uh, there, we have a group that is going to be with Stephen. So if, we, if you want to join, uh, and I can read the, the group, if you want to, uh, Stephen is going to stay here. And, go ahead. What's the estimated size per group? Because I think that if it's only going to be about three people, that that's not going to be a productive conversation. It, yeah, there's a, there's going to be about, we, we were hoping for five people per group, but I think there's going to be about three plus the board members. So if the board members and the administrators, so that would be uh, you know, at least five people. And in education, when you're doing a small group dialogue, what's the ideal range for the number? I don't understand. I, I don't. I, I just. Like, is, is that going to be productive, or should we can we, we, we can we can bring two groups together. The tables are together, so if it's feeling too too small, we can have the groups join. We already have the administrators sitting at the tables, and Stephen is going to stay here. 
So we have uh, Steven's group has Jonathan and Zach uh, here, and then we have Jen and Becca and Elizabeth and Ursula are going to manage our online uh, group. We are going to break into two groups. And then we have uh, uh, Julia, who's sitting already. Where are you, Julia? There. Julia is sitting already at the table with uh, Diane and Daniel are going to join Julia. And whoever wants to join them, you know, however you feel more comfortable. Then Alicia is also sitting at a table back there. You can see her. And she's going to be with Chris and Natasha. And then we have uh, Celia and Julia. Uh, Julia, can you, Julia Hewitt and myself will be with Celia. And then Caroline, there's Caroline. Uh, Caroline and uh, Keely is traveling for work, so it's going to just be Michaela at that table. And then Jared and Suzanne are at the last table there, and Patrick and Michelle. Uh, Michelle couldn't be with us today, so Patrick, you're at that table. When, so and if sorry. tables who have, if your table feels too small, combine with another table. I'm sure yeah. your note takers will be, will be um, happy to share that responsibility. Can you, um, I, I know you did this, but can you just one more time um, articulate what the role of the board is in these conversations? Because I will be 100% transparent. I am not in a headspace to do this. Yeah. Like, I just, you're lucky I'm here tonight. <laughs> um, so what is... What is our role in this? Just so I'm clear when I go to the table. Uh, we envision the board as listeners who would engage in the dialogue if they can and want to. And, and sharing with them, you know, what is your understanding of what you heard, you know, like, and, and finding I, out what honestly, is their I, understanding. I didn't comprehend anything tonight. Okay. Because today's a really crappy day for me. Yeah. So I, I am in no position to facilitate anything. You're with Chris. Can you lean on him, maybe, too? Uh, well, he's, he's going to have to lead it. it I, like I do not have the capacity. It sounds like we're yeah. not facilitating. We're yeah. Yeah. So. Yes, yeah. you're not facilitating. No, that's yeah. fine. I Administrators mean, I just, can I help with the facilitation, and it was anyway, so I'm kind of like. Yeah. And part of the idea of doing it as small is, to, is precisely because of that, too, Natasha, to just allow people to be in small groups and be at their capacity, not feel. So, um, so, Chris. Since, since Stephen's the font of all knowledge, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to assume that you have more, you are uh, of, of more universal knowledge. Um, would there would you object to doing a Q and A with the uh, community at the after we break out of our small groups? Because I think having yeah. that dialogue is really important for us. I mean, we have the dialogue ourselves. But to include these folks, I think is I will I will I will answer what I can answer. No, no, yeah, uh, that's yeah. but yeah, I mean I'm yeah. 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 We'll do it when we come back yeah. from the groups. Right, yeah. We we're exactly. we're doing half an hour. That's why we had blocked for this. We're gonna do half an hour now, uh, and Jen is moving we're going to into you to yeah right? yes. Is that okay? So we're gonna invite you to find a table where you feel comfortable. Okay. Join um, the board member and administrator there. Administrators, you're going to need to make a copy of the notes document. Okay. Can everybody hear me? We're going to move into. We're, we're going to see how many people we have online and in person that we like to ask questions specifically uh, to the framework that was presented. Jeannie, should we start with that or report out from our groups? Yeah. <coughs> we didn't really make a plan, what do you yeah. think? Uh, groups first, okay. Okay, so do you want me to go through number by number? Yeah, so maybe I'll ask our administrators to come a little closer because you guys were taking our notes. Would you like your administrators to report out? Yeah, just that brief is that I didn't, we didn't share that with them, so I feel bad. Uh, administrators, just so you know, we're gonna invite you to report out uh, what a little high leverage takeaways from your conversations, knowing we'll have the notes as well. Stephen, would you like to go first and report out for your group? Uh, uh, my group was more of a Q&A, so we weren't 
following the same model. So you want to go with the other. Okay. So there's no need for a gear. No, no, no. <laughs> just kidding. Jen and Becca, you were with the Zoom group. Do you want to grab a mic and do a quick report out, one or oh, the other of you? Becca's got it. Thank you. So I'm going to summarize as I read. <laughs> Wait, there yet. Um, we were online. Thanks, folks, for your patience who were online in um, keeping up with our technology. And a couple of key takeaways from each of the questions. Um, folks are really pleased with the clarity and simplicity of the presentation and understanding of how complicated and how many moving parts there are in both our schools and school budgets um, more broadly, and noted that it was really helpful to start from the ground up rather than the top down um, to really think about how are we meeting our obligations first and then what does that look like in terms of our vision. Um, a couple of concerns that came up one was this question of an apples to apples comparison. So we have started using the long-term weighted ADM that doesn't show the actual number of pupils in a school, but it has a weighting factor and the questions about how can we compare year over year? Do we have other kind of ways of breaking down actual students um, in some grounding of what we used to know as just a point of familiarity? Um, and then, really, I think this came up both in the priorities and also in kind of needs moving forward was this idea of that the needs and priorities of individual students and individual schools are continuously in flux and how can we make sure that there's transparency around how we understand those individual needs, um, both at the student level, with keeping in mind privacy concerns, and also at the school level. and. And then I think there was a, just a reflection on process. Lastly, was to think about it was helpful to do this process and also that as this process of small group discussion and feedback becomes routine, that perhaps more folks will join and feel comfortable joining, knowing ahead of time what to expect. Um, group, who was there? Anything that... It, I left out to add. Okay. Alicia, would you like to share out? And we'll need to pass that mic. Sure. Uh, Suzanne joined our group, thankfully, because a lot of the takeaways um, were around the conversation around long term ADM. What does that mean? What goes into it? What students are accounted for? Um, a question around transparency to voters. Is that something and to what level should we share with voters? Like how, how do we weight students? And what does that look like knowing that there is, um, there's pieces of that that probably can't be as transparent as others, but maybe at some general level. Um, talked about also an appreciation for the ground up approach um, that resonated well with folks but also a feeling of it still being a little bit unclear, like exactly what does that mean and the hope for maybe the next board meeting having those specifics to better understand that. Um, and then some concerns, just uh, one of the topics of conversation was just around the how hard last year's budget season was and the concern and just questions about is it gonna feel the same this year. Um, just wondering about how to honor the work um, around the administrator's autonomy and creating the recommendations and balancing that with the board's need for keeping a big picture, like the big bucket, right? And, not, and that level of detail and identifying priorities. Um, some conversation around is there an assumption, just the, one of the concerns also is just how to separate the configurations, closing of school to the budget conversation, um, and just making sure to, to kind of shift that narrative and make sure now we know both conversations are happening and 
uh, this is about the budget. Um, and then just the last piece, what's really important to people, just to remember, sometimes it feels like in these budget conversations we just talk strictly numbers and facilities, and we need to remember that these are actually buildings with people and children who need to feel loved and cared for. Um, these are communities, um, and it's sometimes easy to just talk about the details of the numbers. Um, I think that's all. Anything you would add, Suzanne? Thank you. Celia. Jared. Jared. Hi, I'm Celia. <laughs> yeah. oh, sorry. That sounded like you, didn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, well. Um, so our um, biggest takeaways were one, that it was the beginning of a framework to address the budget process. Like it was informative to see this new process. And there was some optimism about the process that it's building from the ground up right, instead of just sort of always just shaving off whatever we needed to find. There was this, this optimism and that it was important um, that the community knew that we were building from the bottom up. Um, excited to hear the banded chorus wasn't brought up immediately as a, uh, a possible place to find savings. Um, and so those were some of the, um, the biggest takeaways. Some of the concerns, the concern about the soul of the community and that schools are that, and that there was a concern about that, and was that going to be taken into account um, through this process? Um, concerns about you know a, sc a small school not being accounted for in the process um, properly, in a way, right? Like that, you know, because it's a small school, or there's small schools, they may get overlooked a little bit. That was a concern. Um, there was a concern that uh, the community um, has to continue to struggle for survival every couple of years that it's always constantly in the back of their minds that the next year could be the year that the schools are gone, that certain schools are gone. Um, concern that this process might not give us the information we need, that because it is new and there's not a lot of understanding exactly yet, that was a concern, like is it gonna give us that information that's needed? Um, so that was one concern. Um, and then uh, busing became, uh, came up uh, and the inequitable nature of some of the busing that's there. And then something that was especially important was learning about um, the sixth grade and what that means and, and what implication that has and what is that moving forward. And, you know, it was brought up again. Um, and so that was the one thing that we, we really took away as a priority, which was just learning more about what does that even mean. Thank you, Jerry. Yep. Carolyn. Caroline? Thanks, we had such a great time meeting, so thank you. Um, it was, I didn't know anybody in my group um, other than McKaylin, and we just had a lovely conversation um, with lots of connection. So the biggest takeaways, when we had that question, we spent time talking about layers one through six um, because there were just questions about what exactly it means and what fits into those layers and what would be an outlier from those layers. Hold on. There we go. Um, for question two, um, the concerns. So one concern was that it felt formulaic um, and not being sure that we are looking at real people. Um, there was also some curiosity to see th how the numbers compare to previous allocations. Um, there was a comment that one board looking at one school budget seems like it would be helpful. Uh, lots of real people who are known to each other and who know all the kids. Um, somebody else shared that the flip side is the implicit assumption based on the knowledge of the kid, whereas an equitable approach is a relief um, so that uh, that can be missed when individual people are making decisions as opposed to a system. Um, there was a thought that maybe it would help with some inequities. Um, wondering how it will actually work, fear of the unknown and skepticism. Um, and then there was a lot of thinking around special education. Um, excited by some of the things that are seen, but there was the a concern with particularly that slide um, resulting in reduction of special education. Um, the teaching staff and the paras and would just like that explained a little more. And then what was especially important or what was the priority 
um, having equities across the district, transparency no matter the size of the school, quality of education across all schools, including U32, over cuts that could diminish quality, um, special education with quality special educators and paraeducators. Um, and then there was a quick question about is a full-time nurse a priority? And this part, the discussion, um, there, were, there were differences of opinion. So I'll just read sort of each of the notes. So one was we never had a full-time nurse and we found ways around it. My priority would be um, towards those who can, who can teach students. Um, another comment was that COVID effects are real and the nurse and counselors are needed. Another was um, nurse and school counselor support the whole community. Um, a comment that a para could be trained um, to provide this support and a comment that mental health, um, everyone in the school provides mental health support. And that was our group, thank you. Is there another group I should pass this? No, that's all of our groups. I think we're moving into Q&A. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I no, missed you on my online. list. Hi, I'm Julia. Sorry, um, we Julia. We were group number three, that's okay. Um, we likewise had a great group and really robust conversation. Um, for the first question, what were the biggest takeaways um, from the budget presentation? Mainly that it's complicated and um, we're just learning how the process works. It feels like a lot of material to learn in a short amount of time, but overall it was well presented, so way to go, Stephen. It felt a little bit vague, just lacking some of the details that people were hoping for. Uh, in terms of concerns about the budget framework, um, folks mentioned you know there was a time when there were individual boards in our in our each school, and people miss that level of presentation and that level of detail they they used to have about the budget. And it's hard now to be a consolidated district and not feel like they're as knowledgeable as they were before. There are concerns that as we're doing this work that it will result in um, the breaking up of staff into smaller FTE, which could result in um, staff not staying or splitting staff between too many schools that create a really difficult job for them. Um, there's a desire for consistency of services for students. Um, also, uh, it was mentioned that they'd like more explanation about encouraging bigger classroom numbers with increased student needs, as we know, are happening in our buildings and um, wanting some assurance that the admin team will be looking for the um, minimum rather than just immediately going to those maximums. And also the, uh, there's a concern that um, there will be changes to food service and a feeling that it's important we maintain food access for all students and families that include local foods. And lastly, um, what's important, what would we like to prioritize? Um, some people in the community would like more opportunities for just discussion about class size, how the numbers were decided, um, how the leadership team is going about making decisions around any split positions between buildings. And lastly, just wanting a focus on first instruction being universally designed, that there are opportunities for enhanced learning opportunities and a curriculum that is designed to meet a wide range of learners. Thank you, Julia. Apologies for almost missing you. Did I miss anybody else before we go to Q&A? Okay. We'll continue to use that mic for Q&A, is that right? Is there anybody who has a question? Do we want to move into public comment for it? Or do you, did you check the Zoom? Okay, we got one. Okay, great. I was, I was just reminded of my question. Thanks, <laughs> Carter. Um, first of all, I just wanted to share an appreciation for this process, because I think it really was really valuable. Um, the question was, hopefully Carter can help me, this is a new budget process and hoping that maybe you could clarify what is different about this process than prior ones. Yeah, I, th I think the, the biggest single difference is that we tended to uh, start our budget process in the past with what if we took exactly what the district is now and put it into next year 
And then we started from that and said, okay, then what do we have to cut to get down to a number that's manageable for our community, a percentage increase and all of that. What we're really trying to do is, is just go back and do a wholesale look at the budget this time. And as you heard from several of the comments, build it from the ground up. What's the kind of the base services that we need to provide for everybody um, a, across our schools? What does that look like? How do we calculate that? You know, because there, there is certain, what's the calculations that we can apply to that? And then how do we uh, provide those support services enrichments that all the students need? And what does that look like within each of our schools? Um, because each school has some uniqueness to it around that. Um, and so really just how do we then add those things on? and I will say that I was a little bit harsh with my leadership team as keeping that the increase, the number that you have to work with is, was lower than what they probably wanted. Um, so that we started at that point is can we do this for just a 3% increase? I, uh, just foreshadowing, probably not. Um, but, we're, but it at least gave us a place to start and to, to really evaluate what systems are in our schools, what, um, what services are we delivering, and what do those services cost us in order to meet the basic needs and then the intervention support and enrichment needs of our kids. And so we really, are, we really were trying to look at it from the ground up as opposed to cutting down to something. That never feels good um, when we just say cut. Instead, how do we build um, from the bottom up? Any other questions? What, one other question that came up in our group, um, Carter, Worcester resident, um, was at what points in the process, uh, you know, these, these conversations inspire these anecdotes, of, well, what about this, what about that? Um, just curious, at what points in the process are you vetting sort of the result of the new formula against, you know, the on the ground reality, right? That, well, someone's having this experience over here, how does the formula address that next year, you know? So I, I think there may be two, if I can be so bold as to think there are two places where that conversation comes up, not only amongst the principals as they talk to their staffs and, and they bring this information back. So we work together as a team in developing the budget. But then the other part is what came from these conversations that we had tonight. The re we haven't fully created our budget. We're still working on that and this information is going to be incorporated into that. That's why we have it electronically and we can go back and review it and see, hey, were there other things that we need to consider as we're going through? I mean, I've already written down some stuff just from the, from what you guys just said and from the time I just spent talking with folks. So I think there's more clarity that we need to offer, certainly, uh, around this process, but also, you know, how do we address some of those concerns as well? Any other questions? Any questions on Zoom either? Noah Weinstein from Worcester. Um, I just want to say, yeah, I, I really appreciated this process. I got more questions answered in the half an hour than I had in like eight months. So that was awesome. Um, and um, so one question is about how there seems to be sort of like, there's the budget process, which is yearly. There's the configuration process, which it sounds like you guys are trying to look out at least two years before making big decisions about things like that. And then there are these conversations about like high school consolidation or even mergers with districts. So I'm curious sort of that level of restructuring, sort of when and how do those conversations happen? Um, All right, so um, eight months ago we started. Um, <laughs> I, I would say that um, to, to answer all three of them, so we're, we're focused right now, the leadership team is primarily focused on the budget right now. So, so I would say that that's our, our number one priority at this moment in time. Um, the configuration components are part of our discussion, like what would we, you know, what are we seeing as, we, as we're looking at the spending that we're doing and, and what are the long-term sustainability of some of the, the systems that we've got in front of us. So what recommendations might we make as a leadership team about where configuration could go next? And then it's also a board discussion at that point in time, a board and community discussion around um, configurations of, of students uh, within our district. 
I would say that the biggest question you just asked is about district consolidation between districts. And that's, a, that's something that I will turn over to board chair because that's not a superintendent driven piece, that's a board. So we understand that we have enough interest. We actually reached out to AOE. They are looking at the process, not as simple as just doing another 706B committee, right? And we would have multiple uh, people, it's not just Montpelier that is interested in having that conversation with us, it's also Twinfield is interested in having that conversation with us. There's been a lot of, uh, not a lot, but enough people talking about regional too. So, so it is a more holistic uh, process uh, that that will happen. So we're still waiting for guidance. Great, that's okay. great. Yeah, just, just wanting to make sure that that process, yeah. and maybe just another question that maybe more for Flora, but maybe for the whole board too, that, that one of the ideas that we presented in our letter was considering restructuring the configuration committee. I know that there was a conversation last time about putting two community members on, and then Keeley had said, that might get weirdly political because which two towns get community members on the, you know. So the idea that, that we had expressed as a community is the question of would it be possible to have one board member and one community member from each community on the configuration committee plus three administrators? And so is that something the board would consider? It, so we, uh, Daniel and I have charged ourselves to looking at the charge of the committee. We are gonna bring it to the uh, steering committee. Uh, the, but we had said, and I'm speaking for both of us, is that hopefully we would have something for the Finance Committee to just sort of look at it uh, next Tuesday, then we would bring it to the Steering Committee, and then the Board will make that decision. And just to, I don't want to be the one bringing a different point of view. I, I have had people reach out to me, and I think some of them are actually in the online uh, committee saying like, you know, they they feel like two people is, is enough into the community because they already feel that their community is not represented because they have more students, right? So there is like, they, they sent us a letter to about this. So we, I, we've heard from, from both, they are unwilling to like put it on an email. They did put it on a letter before. So I, I think that we have as a board, we have to balance uh, both things. Well, I guess the last one I'll just throw out there is, is the front porch forum request that, that there have been times where we don't get the front porch forum posts that we should be getting. And if the board had their own front porch forum account so that what, could go out to all of the towns, then we wouldn't miss the posts. Yeah. So what we did this time, Stephen posted and Melissa posted on front porch forum because the information was coming in on Monday. So Stephen posted on front porch forum, Melissa posted on front porch forum for everybody. We do not want to lose as a steering committee the ability of the steering committee to have that direct connection. I'm looking at you, Michaela, and others that have a direct connection with the with their community. The other thing is but that it's Michaela's a lot. Michaela's not on the steering committee. It's Natasha now. Yes. Yeah, I know, but she's not here. So I'm like looking at Michaela because Natasha left, right? But uh, the other thing is that as a, I, I'm not saying that it's not a good investment, but in the climate that we're right now, it is a lot more costly for us as a district and doesn't allow us to to publish as much. So part of the idea of having the steering committee uh, post is because of that. And that was that one <coughs> post that I believe, uh, you know, just recently, and then it was shared with you, Lila. I know that there was, uh, a, like two weeks ago, I didn't know that it was not posted. We resolved the chain, you know, that chain to make sure that it's posted. The last post was posted. This last one, we had Melissa post because it was too close and we didn't want to miss anybody. Yeah, so just as a point, we, we're allowed five posts a month as a, as a district. And so um, after that, the costs are pretty high, but individuals within a town can post quite a bit. I, I, it's not unlimited, but they, they have the opportunity to post, which is why we rely upon the board members to post those pieces. Yeah. As long as there's some feedback loop so that it gets checked mm -hmm. after yes. the fact and says, yep, it happened. And, and that's what Great. we did. Yep. Thank you, guys. Gonna, this is awesome. There's no more questions. No, nope. oh, Lila. Lila. Um, Lila Richardson, also from Worcester. Um, I just wanted to clarify the timeline for when you're developing the budget because you're making it sound at this meeting as if it's sort of in the future for the next board meeting. It's my understanding that you are going to come out with a draft 
in two days and that that would be presented to the Finance Committee next week. Is that still true? So, so we have a general draft, that, we, but we wanted to get feedback as well from here so that we can finalize that for the board. So it's not, I will say that what the Finance Committee is going to get is not going to be detailed draft at this point in time. We still have some details to work out, but we want to give them a, a good picture of where we are at this point in time so that then the following week, essentially, we're able to provide a detailed draft. Of the, of the budget. And will the draft that you're going to give the Finance Committee be available this Friday for their packet? S Suzanne, I would turn to you. Like, we'll have the, the materials that you were just describing will have in the packet on Friday. Yeah, but it will, not, I, I just want to be clear, it will not be school level information at that point in time. Um, it's going to be a, gen it's going to be the general categories at that point in time. Okay, thanks. Is there still time for public comment? Yes. Okay. Any other? Any other public comment beyond just questions? Thank you, Julia. Caitlin Holansky, Worcester. Um, one of the ideas that the community brought to the board was um, some independent review of equity and budget, and I was just wondering if um, any steps are going to be taken in that direction. We haven't looked at it yet, but that is something that is, as we move through the process, we'll look and see what we can do. I, I think that we're probably going to get some direction from the AOE um, around some of this, so I don't want to jump the gun too much on what we're going to look at. I don't know what kind of review process they may put in place this year yet. So it would be something that would possibly occur next year, if at all? I, I would say that that would be the earliest that we would do it, yes. Okay. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank you for your facilitation. Thank you, everybody, for taking a chance with us in the format today. Uh, let's, uh, we're going to move into the rest of our board meeting, uh, but I wanted to give a chance to our wonderful students, which we put them right in center. They have a very brief uh, little update. For, yeah, student report, which should add some, and then we're going to take a two-minute break to use the facilities because people have been sending, sitting for a long time, and then we'll finish our, our meeting. So thank you guys. Take it. All right, we only have like... Um, hello? Is it good? Is it on? Uh, yes. Oh, yes. there we go. Okay. We only have about five things, but um, we will... Speak right into the mic. We will tell you all five things. <laughs> uh, so about 13 days ago, we had a great fall concert that I forget if it was middle school and high school. I it was. Don't, no. It was both. It was both? Okay, wonderful. Um, with a jazz band, which we had uh, apparently a three-year-long hiatus on that. So that was great to have. Yep. Um, U32, we have a few students representing at the Winooski Music Valley, Winooski Valley Music um, Festival, Festival, I believe, on November 22nd, which is super exciting. Um, there is currently out a marine ecology course available to U32 students, current grades 9 through 12, uh, and that has you go to the some, Bermuda, I believe. Yeah, yeah, something like that. You go to Bermuda at the end. Okay. It's actually like really that. cool. Um, and then sports, um, all fall, yeah, all fall sports are done except cross country. Um, cross country won, as always. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the field hockey he made it to the state championships, but we lost in the finals. And then soccer. Um, teams didn't make it that far, but it's okay. Um, fall sports social is Tuesday next week. Um, and then preseason start already. Um, so we ended last week and now we have preseasons this week, which is so um, excellent. Hockey has started, basketball started, I believe indoor track has started. Um, and skiing hasn't because no snow to ski on, but yeah. Um, and then our last piece of information is that uh, 
Saturday, November 9th, between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., there will be a craft fair in the gym, I believe it is, again. Um, it's, uh, it'll be, it'll probably be great like it was last year. There's a bunch of local craft people who do their crafts, and y'all should come and support them. Yep, that's our student All right, thank y'all. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you for being here. <laughs> okay, uh, do you guys, three minutes, and we'll come back for board learning. I promise I just have five questions. <laughs> we'll do conversations. I really want to thank our administrators for being here today. Please don't feel like you have to stay, and thank you for all the work that you are doing. It's late. Okay. We're going to move into board learning. I am sure all of my board members read the entire chapter of that book. We even scan it for those of you that didn't have a book or couldn't find it. Did you read it? <laughs> okay. So what I, what I thought we could, uh, we could do is, uh, hold on one minute. I, I drafted some questions. I thought we could concentrate on the summary. I know it's late. I, does want, I do want us to have some common ground because some of us have read it before. Some of us have never read it. And I think we all found it valuable, right, Chris? You're in your helping mode today, so you like this I book. I am in a helping mode. But you like this book, you, didn't you? I, I was on, I should, I'm okay. on the fence. Uh, because I'm okay. going to ask you, it talks about um, a um, lighthouse school. Oh, sorry. It talks about Lighthouse School, um, and I couldn't find a great definition of what that meant and how many Lighthouse Schools are really in existence in terms of uh, the, because um, they're extrapolating principles of, of, for functioning from these Lighthouse Schools, you know, being, saying that they're successful. So it would be good to know how many schools they're really talking about that they're extrapolating the principles from. Okay. It just wasn't clear so, to me. Okay. I'll try what, to find out yeah, okay. with the author. Uh, and plus the lighthouse, you know, it's like just, okay. at night and it's dark, you know, it has a single beam of <laughs> okay. light and we have broad, okay. broader discussions. Okay. So I'll try to summarize a couple of things really quickly and just ask some questions okay. uh, to see. Yes, Michaela. I just have a general question. Yes. I think, I think that board learning is super important and my question is, does does it have to take place within open meeting? Is it doesn't. That it it doesn't have to take. So, like what we did our um, so my retreat would be in the future to not have it included in a board meeting, but to set aside a separate time. So the reason that we have, for the past few years, tried to include it in our first meeting of the of the of the month was to not add another day because it was really hard to schedule another day and put more pressure on board members. So what we've done in the past is just either have somebody facilitate. We haven't done it in a little while. I, we had enough, you know, we're always a new board when we get new board members. So I, the idea was to just do, you know, there were not enough board members volunteering to go to the board learning that we just did at the conference of the Vermont School Board Association either. So the idea is that, you know, it's nice to do something all together, but I'm happy to send a doodle poll to see if we can get another another time that we can we can meet. Usually we don't have as much. We Today we were trying to do a, a lot. You know, we pared the agenda down to the bare minimum, right? <laughs> but we still have we still have a lot. And I promise I'll just ask, I had five questions. I'm just gonna ask two and see if there's any conversation. Any conversation. So the first chapter is really uh, based in the principles of roles and responsibilities, strategic focus, collaboration and trust, adaptability and community engagement. So uh, my hope is that with these questions we could help but sort of reflect in our own governance uh, practices. We are hopefully going to do uh, self-evaluation for ourselves, which is part of governance standards that we're going to have to comply to in July of 2025. So this is kind of a practice run. Uh, run. So I could ask a question. In, I'm going to ask a question in roles and, resp uh, and responsibilities and, um, and in adaptability, if that's okay with 
with you guys, and then we will pick some other principles, or unless you guys rather have me ask a question on community engagement, because we're community engagement today. But I'm gonna start with roles and responsibilities. Uh, so there's, it's a question in two parts, and you can decide which question you wanna answer or not. We don't, if you don't wanna, you know, you can just pass. But uh, how, do, how, how do we do as a board, uh, and how do we understand and respect about the boundaries between governance and management? Which are the areas that, you know, that we tend to overstep or how can we improve? That would, you know, after what we read, right? It's so this is just self-reflection, it's just really us here tonight. And I know that a lot of us don't have any bandwidth anymore, so you could also just share something that in, in that area of roles and responsibilities that you, you know, that you highlight it. So I, I think this is an area where we have a lot of that natural tension that occurs. And yeah. so to be very honest, I can't engage in that conversation. So I'm, I mean, I'm going to pass, but it's because my bandwidth at this point is really Zero. nil. And so I am a little concerned at having that conversation now because this is a critical piece for us to all come to a common understanding. Um, and an understanding of when it looks like I'm overstepping, for me, it might be because of X, Y, and Z in my mind. And so I, I would appreciate the opportunity, and I get it. We absolutely have said we've met enough, we're not meeting again, and things like that. And so finding that, but I, I just can't in, for me, I'm not able to engage okay. in this conversation so, tonight. It's, it's 10 minutes to nine, so. Yeah. We can just we can just table this for tonight uh, with you guys reading it and uh, and then we'll pick it up. Uh, uh, you know, I, I hesitate to add more into your calendars considering that we're going to have a lot of budget conversations. So we'll pick it up. We'll I'll bring it up to the steering committee to find a time to to schedule it. Thank you. So thanks for reading okay. the book. Is that everybody okay with that? Thumbs yes. up. Okay. So then let's move. Uh, Immediately, if I can read, uh, I almost want to table this one too, but communication and engagement plan. I just put the, again, the, um, the board development that we approved. Okay. Yes. And I just wanted to reflect on today and, you know, how do we plan any input that you want to give the steering committee for planning our next uh, engagement, which would be December 6th or 4th. 4th uh, we put it in there. And, um, been a long day. So if there's anything that you guys quickly would want to reflect or add so that we have it in our minds, yes. Yeah, I heard a lot in our group and then in the larger group as well, the appreciation of being able to pull out and really, I think the, the questions that were asked tonight were much more pointed and I think that was super, super helpful. Um, and I think people really appreciated that because it made the conversations richer and more detailed so that people could actually ask the questions they're thinking about. So I thought that was very helpful. And one person did say that it would be great to have more opportunities like that um, as opposed to like general public comment or things like that. So the more that we can do it, I think the more clear this process can feel for everybody. Ursula? I was just going to build off of that because I was in the same group as Elizabeth. Um, but there was some discussion on having it be a predictable cycle too so that people then, it, it builds on that expectations of being able to have a small group which might be easier to talk in and so then people know that they'll have that opportunity and they'll be more likely to come even in person possibly. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Any, Daniel. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with all that. I also think it's worth pointing out that um, I think this is a little bit of a phenomenon of the squeaky wheel getting the grease. And, and Worcester was, like, came out in force with so much enthusiasm tonight, and I really appreciate that. And as a food person, I really appreciate the potluck. And this was, this was a, like, a unique opportunity that was afforded to one town, and we're in a five-town district. And I don't know how we replicate something like this in other towns. Because when we came to my town, it was not the same kind of dialogue. Mm -hmm. Nor was it last year. We've had some like really acrimonious meetings in Calais, and those have been our community forums, I guess. 
but I'd like to have something similar to this in each, in each, in each town. And I, I, I also want to acknowledge the challenge of getting the turnout here, or the turnout elsewhere that we got here, because people did show up, and I really appreciate that, and the level of enthusiasm and engagement might be hard to match in other towns. In, Thank you, Dan. In response, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. No. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it, it's a, it's a but our meetings are a scarce interchange. resource also. Like, it's hard yeah. to find, and the budget, the budget calendar is, is a finite period of time yeah. with a finite period of, or number of meetings. So it's, it's a challenge, mm -hmm. I think, to spread ourselves and spread access to this board and its agenda across all five towns. So, mm -hmm. But we get, I agree, we yeah. should try. Yeah, we should try. Um, and also, Callis had the misfortune of having two very contentious <laughs> meetings, like yeah, yeah. the budget last yeah. year and then the configuration this year. So those um, lend yeah, themselves, and, unfortunately. And as we schedule our meetings, we can take also into consideration as we plan for next budget season to make sure that this meeting today, the first meeting, occurs in a different school. Every yeah, I would just offer, we shifted um, the meetings um, so that they didn't start at the same time. So we weren't doing the same school at the same time of year. Um, and so this is just, there's some by chance that we ended up here, um, but it's, but we need to make sure that we yeah. create that opportunity. But just to clarify, part of the reason that we got such great turnout is that the Friends of Doty Community Group sponsored that potluck that started at 515. They said free food and you know folks folks came together and, and there was free child care too. And I think maybe the timing after the election people wanted to be together as well in yeah. community. So no, I think we can learn from right? from yeah. the success yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, um, did you did the uh, question and answer discussion it sound like you had before? when we had broken into groups, did that work for you? Uh, uh, yeah. That, was it helpful? Yeah, I, I think just uh, getting some of the additional questions out and answered, um, and then we, we had a few of those same questions were asked yeah. to the whole group, which I think worked out well. Okay. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I think that there, there's another part of the communications that we need to do, and, and I talked to this in the smaller group, is that um, being able to be out in the community for me to answer questions throughout this budget season is important. And I, I also didn't want to overpromise the ability to go do that, but mm -hmm. but um, but be able to to find some opportunities to be at various places around the district, and and be available to not just the, you know these are mostly school community people, but the community as a whole, and making sure the word gets out so that anybody in any of the towns can get some of their questions answered. Um, so okay. I'm going to make an attempt at it and. It's first year for me trying to get a schedule going as well. So, I, I, like I said, I don't want to overpromise, but it's certainly a goal to try to get that done. Great. Thanks. I was just going to piggyback on that, but also say that I think in this process there's a lot of questions and then there's context, and I think that back and forth engagement was craved by mm -hmm. the community and I think that it was very valuable because when they had a question and you answered it they could piggyback that to get more context or more information and I, I just think it was a really valuable tool and I'm not putting you on the spot but um, I, you know you know everything so we're good um, no but I do think that that's really valuable and however we can fold that into meetings even um, is really helpful I think for the community Patrick. Yeah, one point. Um, I think that there. Are, I think what what we showed tonight was that there are three different kinds of public comment that are all valuable, um, uh, and there might be more. But the three that I'm going to say, the small groups I think worked in for some things. The, the large group Q and A I think was really helpful, like, like, like we, uh, people have been saying. But I think there's also a place for the public comment where we where we shut up and let people talk mm -hmm. to us. Mm -hmm. And and I think that that. Um, that's not the right answer for everything, but, right. but I think it is. I think there is a place for that. So um, maybe we can be creative about, uh, you know, this part of the agenda is for Q&A, where we actually respond. And then this other part of the, Q of the agenda is for just comments, where we sit on our hands and, 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 and just, just take the comments from, from communities. Because I think that's really helpful, too. Yeah. OK. Mm -hmm. So. We'll talk as a steering committee. We, Daniel and I, are also going to meet about the configuration uh, committee and the charge. And Stephen is also helping me find the, the previous charge. Um, and then I was going to mention that I, 
I, I was just recently in a national meeting and I was talking to another superintendent and what they do is that, and I'm not gonna put more pressure on Steven, but what they do is that it, they have a, a coffee time once a month with this with the superintendent and then there's a rotation of board members so two board members non speaking they're just there to listen it's the word in theory but they're there to listen with the community uh, you know whoever is able to attend that's one thing that they do uh, but that is not for us to decide you decide what would be good <laughs> I would just say, I was at a meeting recently and board chairs were taking their superintendents to dinner. And, you know, <laughs> I, well, she said tonight, Stephen. I, don't know. I need a bigger stipend. No, just kidding. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think we are to the end of our agenda, consent agenda. So uh, could I have a motion to approve our minutes? Ursula. I move that we approve the minutes of October 16th, 2024. Okay, and second. second by Chris. Okay, any amendments to the minutes? I wasn't listed Here. as present. <laughs> okay, uh, Lisa, do you have that? Uh, Julia was not listed as present, and she was there. I was online, yeah. She was online. <laughs> yeah. Okay, all those in favor of approving the minutes as amended, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the minutes passed. Uh, and now we're going to move into personnel. Uh, personnel, go ahead. I move that we accept the resignation of Maria Malkos with appreciation from Calis Elementary as a nurse. Malakos. I'm very sorry. Oh. Okay, could I have a second? Second. Thank you, Julia. So, all those in favor of the. Great discussion. Uh, um, do we know why uh, Maria has resigned? So I would just say I'm, I'm, I'm going to point to Heidi. Um, she is conducting an exit interview with Maria as part of that process, and so we will have that information um, or, or whatever she shares with Heidi. Okay. And, um, and, and do we have an, another nurse that can step in at Calis? Um, we are working on staffing our nursing. We, okay. You know that that's been a challenge this right. year across yep. the district. So, yeah, we're working on options for that. Okay, thank you. Floor. Yes, go ahead. I was just curious when, and when that was effective. When it's effective. This Friday. Last day this Friday. Okay, thanks. Okay, so with the appreciation for Maria, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Well, Any abstentions? Ca caveat that I'm not in favor of it, right. but yeah, I can't but really <laughs> stop it. I mean, but. Right. Yeah. <laughs> We are, you're accepting, right? So you don't want to rob her for accepting. Her. <laughs> yeah, we thank you with appreciation oh, yeah, and thank you for, yes. you know, she carried us through the pandemic. It yeah, was, she's, you know, she's yeah. been great for our district. So really thank you, Maria, if you're listening. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the motion carries. <laughs> uh, okay, so now we're gonna move into, we're gonna move Right, a board reflection. <laughs> we did that. And we're gonna, yeah, we already reflected, I think. We did it. Or you wanna we did board that. reflect. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I, I just had one other thought about communication and engagement. Our, our group, Diane's, uh, Julia's and mine, uh, one thing that came up was the sort of loss of dialogue at town meetings. And I, I have personally felt that really significantly and I think it, it needs to be resolved. A district-wide meeting that's not attended by anyone is, helps no one, including the people who come ready to respond to the public. So I'd, I'd like us to revisit sort of how we approach, once we have adopted a budget, how we, how we approach community engagement and, and if possible, like, have delegations to all of the town meetings mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. just to yeah. solicit some feedback and some dialogue. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, that's great. We've do, we've done it in the past. Not all the towns have done it, but we do a slideshow and and just you know share the information. There's no it, it was it's still Australian ballot, not that same conversation, but yeah, let's do it. A public comment, and then we're going to go into executive session. We we are honoring all of the forms, there won't be questions back and forth, this is just public comment. 
and you have one minute. <laughs> Just kidding, one minute and a half. Okay. Your time's already started. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This was actually answering Floor's question. Floor asked me to give feedback on this process. And so um, I wanted to say that I personally enjoyed the small group because I was with Stephen and got to ask a lot of questions that were answered and because we ignored the structure. I also respect that some people really like the small group and so I again would encourage the structure of a small group, a large group, and the Q&A. Um, I will say that it was unfortunate that the questions that I got answered in the small group were not shared with the larger group because we didn't get notes taken. Um, that I found unfortunate. Um, I think that if you're gonna have a structure, especially with small groups, I would encourage to advertise that ahead of time so that other people who might be interested in small group would also come and also advertise the questions um, ahead of time. I will say I found the questions to be sort of unhelpful and distracting, and I think that small groups should have the option of using them as guidance or ignoring them if they choose to. Um, and I also just wanted to push back a little bit on the configuration committee question. And first to say that I would love to see that letter and I think as board correspondence, it should be shared. There's no letter. There's no you said that they wrote a letter. Oh, oh the other letter. Yes, there the, is a That letter. there is a letter written that needs to be shared in the board correspondence for public it's there. consumption. Um, and then also that in terms of the question of um, representation, that from my perspective, the purpose of having community members on the configuration committee is so that they could serve as community liaisons back to their communities. So if you have you know, two communities represented, then let's say Doty, let's say Worcester doesn't get a representative and then Worcester's gonna throw a fit when you wanna close our school yeah. because we weren't on the committee to begin with. So right. I would again come back to the one board member and one community member and administrators. Thank okay. you very much. Noah, can you give the mic please? Thank you for being here. Hi, Del Waterhouse in, from Worcester. I just, um, I was sort of packing things up and I heard the comment about how liking the, the fact that the squeaky wheel gets, the, and, and the idea of wishing that every town could have the same kind of thing. I wanted to say that I know that one thing that we've been talking about here is that we would like to get together and do some visioning for what we would like to see for our school within our community in the future. And I'd imagine that every town would like to do something like that if they stopped and thought about it. So I just, I don't know if that's something that could be um, worked, but that you might wanna work on as well as us trying to work on it here within our town. So just a thought. Thank you, Deb. And thank you, I, I appreciate it's hard to sit <laughs> through a meeting. I don't know how you all do it, but, um, but it, it's been informative and, and, it, and I enjoyed the small conversation, so thanks. Thank you, Del. Okay, could I have a motion to move into executive session so for moved. personnel? Yeah, and to include our superintendent. And to include Stephen Ellinger Pate. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, a second? Second. A second. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 We left the room that we did add quality 